this is the talk. It should make you very worried. Um, the, I'm so happy. I'm always happy when I'm in Reykjavik. Really, I'm always happy because Icelandic feminists always teach me new things, honestly. Um, every time I'm here, uh, I learn new things. My mind gets jostled. Um, I'm made aware of things that I had assumed that I shouldn't assume. I'm just, I'm delighted to be here. And it's always um, the guest program that makes it possible for me to be here. Um, Irma, of course, um, I owe many, many years of thanks to. Christiana, where's Christiana right now? Where'd she, oh, she's always in the back. She doesn't even get a seat. What's, yeah, now she's embarrassed, she's gonna sit down, right, right? But when you're running things, you cannot sit, right? So that just shows how important Christiana is. Um, so I'm just delighted to be here. Um, could all the fellows from the UNU program raise your hands? Everybody should ask to see. Ta-da, ta-da. So we have been, yes. All the fellows are themselves mid-career, um, uh, people from NGOs and from ministries in their own countries. Um, in the last two days, we've already had terrific conversations. They've been teaching me. Um, it's just been, it's been just great. So I'm very privileged to be with all of you. Um, it really is a, is a great experience for me. Um, when um, Irma and Christiana asked what I might um, want to talk about, I thought we should talk about what all of us are talking about. Um, and I guess being here in Iceland, the most radical part of the talk title that I gave it is the two. Hashtag Iceland two, T-O-O. -O. Meaning not Iceland the exception, not Iceland the top of the global gender gap, list of good countries, not that Iceland, the Iceland of the TOO. Um, and um, in many of my conversations with people in Sweden and in Bosnia and um, in Japan, I, I realized how much it does matter where you are when you're trying to speak out against, when you are trying to a challenge and trying to build a movement, it matters where you are. And every place may have some commonalities, but they're not all the same. I think, and I'll come back to this, but I want to introduce it right at the beginning. I think we're really at a point now, we're only in about month five, right? Which is really just taking baby steps. We even have a baby here. So I, it, taking baby steps towards building a sustainable movement. I'm very interested in sustainability. Um, one of the things I've tried to tackle in the big push was how patriarchy gets sustained. We use the word sustainable as if it's always good, like we're all for sustainability when it comes to environment or a peace. But in fact, sustainability is only as good as the thing you're sustaining. And if you're sustaining misogyny, or you're sustaining sexual inequality, or you're sustaining militarism, all of which are sustained, then in fact it takes the bloom off the rose of sustainability. So I'm very interested in how patriarchy has been and continues to be sustained, and how the hashtag MeToo movement perhaps, perhaps, can stop it in its tracks. But there is no such thing as just automatic momentum. It's one of the things that all of us who've been involved in women's rights movements and in anti-sexism movements and in gender equality movements have learned. You cannot rest on your laurels. You cannot think, oh, we've gotten to the point now that it will carry forward itself. It will not carry forward itself. Patriarchy really depends, sustainable patriarchy is sustained by our burning out. When we get tired, patriarchy is happy, right? So it doesn't mean that we can't burn out, we do, but we have to make sure we're not the only one doing the thing we're doing, right? You can get tired, I can get tired, but there's always somebody else around who will pick up the baton um, and carry it forward. Or as Gloria Steinem, who was asked, 
for Gloria. She's always asked these sorts of questions. Gloria Steinem was asked, well, who are you? Because she's 85 now. Can you believe it? You are living in an era where Gloria Steinem is 85 <laughs> and is still making lots of trouble. And that's the good news. And Gloria was asked just recently, well, how are you, you know, you're such an icon, isn't that terrible? I mean, that's really a terrible thing to be called. You are such an icon, the journalist said, uh, how are you passing on your baton? And Gloria, who is of course smarter than most of us, said, I don't have a baton, I have a torch, and I keep lighting the torch to other torches. That's how you sustain a feminist movement. You don't have a baton and then you pass it to the next celebrity, right? You have a torch and you keep lighting many torches so that when you get tired, in fact, there are other people who will be already energized and active and skilled and carry on. But we are at a point, I think, and this is a really interesting moment to be all together today in Reykjavik. We're at a point where in, we're in about month five. If you think that the Harvey Weinstein um, uh, revelations, we should come back to feminist journalists. The only reason we know about Harvey Weinstein is because the New York Times gave a group of three of its fully paid journalists five months without appearing in print, so supposedly not earning their keep, five months, three journalists were given time to do the research to dig out the information about Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein, remember, was not outed by at first by women who were abused by him and spoke out. Harvey Weinstein was first outed by journalists who found all the settlements that he and his lawyers had made, which included in the settlements with women he had abused, included in the settlements a line that holds the force of law that says they may not speak about their experience or about the settlement. And what these journalists did, and this is why we even know the name Harvey Weinstein if we're not movie aficionados, the reason that we know this is because these journalists went and did the hard work and looked at all the settlements and then tracked down the women who were in the settlements. And then one or two of them had the guts to speak out about the settlements. So think about how important feminist researchers are. Think how important feminist journalists are. And think how important feminist editors are. That is the editor who authorizes journalists to spend three months doing seemingly un invisible work to do this kind of digging. Um, we are at a point, I think, now where we, the pushback is becoming more coherent. Um, I wouldn't say quite a movement on the pushback yet, but of course patriarchy doesn't need a movement, really. It is the facts of life. Right? If, if you are the reality, you don't need a movement. Right? But we are beginning to hear the pushback, and it's coming from some women as well as a lot of men. And here's what the pushback, because the pushback has to sound reasonable. I'm very nervous about people who try to sound reasonable, right? Um, always in quotes, reasonable. Yes, yeah, see? Agreed. Um, uh, and that is, and the pushback is taking this form, I think. It's, well, don't we have to make distinctions? Have, have some of you ever heard this? Like, everything isn't rape. Everything that we're hearing about from girl gymnasts to women in the national theater to women who work on airlines or women who work in the Ford Motor Company assembly plants in Detroit, everything we're hearing about, it's the full range. I mean, it's not all, this is the pushback. It, we have to make distinctions. I mean, really, this is now the pushback. Really, I mean, it's clear that telling a sexist joke is just not the same as sexual assault. We have to make distinctions. Now, 
all of us are thinking people, and we do make distinctions. We make distinctions constantly. You make distinctions, we make distinctions in order to make comparisons, right? Oh, this isn't the same as this. And we make comparisons mainly so that we act differently relative to the thing we're comparing. So we say, well, telling a sexist joke at work over the coffee machine is not the same as trying to assault a person trying to make their way in an industry in the producer's hotel room. That's a distinction, and we should take on board that one is really different than the other, and we should then act accordingly. Now, we make distinctions, right? We know how to make distinctions. But the pushback is, don't get upset, girls. Calm down, All right? Really, why are you getting so exercised, so excited? maybe even angry, about the sexist joke practice. Yes, get a angry, go into formal action around actual physical sexual assault and the perpetrators of those assaults, but don't get confused, dear, about as if that is the same as the person who tells an unfortunate joke at the workplace. Here's what I've been thinking about this, about the you have to make distinctions pushback. First of all, of course, we do know how to make distinctions, right? Most, many of you here in the room have taken part in writing laws about rape and how police and courts deal with rape as versus laws and rules and um, punishments for sexual harassment in the workplace. We have made distinctions. What I think is really important about this moment in the Me Too movement is for us all to realize what we're doing. Why are we getting exercised about the sexist joke, the comments on a woman's appearance and what she wears to work, and it seems as though we are as excited about that in the Me Too movement as we are about hearing these horrible revelations about abuse by coaches or doctors or theater producers. And I think it's because, as feminists, we make connections. Connections is really different than mere comparison. When you make comparisons, that is, you make distinctions, that's really important. It's not as if we shouldn't make distinctions. But never be pushed, persuaded, convinced that making distinctions is more important than making connections. Making connections is what is radical. It's saying, look, I'm hearing about what goes on in all kinds of workplaces. And a lot of that just, most of us brush it off Anadise and Sig and I talked about this the other night, as if there are mosquitoes around us. <laughs> Go away, you know, right? Which is the kind of workplace sexism that so many women have had to deal with for so long. We're now saying, oh, those things that we swatted away as if they were just annoyances that a woman has to live with. And we're saying, no, no, this is the Me Too moment, I think. That is connected, and I'm talking about causality. Causality is what's radical about feminism. When you start talking about what causes what, you're doing, going to the core of how societies organize themselves. We're saying that the mosquitoes of everyday sexism around us is causally connected to actual physical intimidation and possible assault. We're saying we're not going to box one over here and treat that like a mere annoyance, and we'll box this over here and take legal action. In the Me Too movement, I think, I think, I feel as though we're at a moment now where the, this, the pushback is make distinctions. Don't punish 
a man who has made sexist jokes the same way that you're going to punish a man who has actually sexually um, assaulted somebody. And we're at the moment saying, no, no, we're not in a movement to make distinctions. We're in a movement to make connections. And that's because the sexist jokes, the comments about appearance, the not listening to women at meetings, that those are causally connected to the most overt sorts of misogynist practices which take the form of actual physical intimidation and or assault. Make sense? And it's, it's really hard at the moment when you hear the pushback um, to actually take this seriously because you think, you start defending yourself and saying, I am making distinctions. But in fact, it's the connections that we're after because it's the it's the web of connections that create sustainable patriarchy. And let me just, because we have great responders here and we want some discussion for all of us. Let me just make clear what I think we have to look at in any workplace or in any organization, including, by the way, social movements. You know, peace movements can have misogynists within them, right? That the people who are sustaining this culture is are people who in fact do not look like outright perpetrators. What they are is enablers. I'm very interested in who, including any of us, is an enabler. Who doesn't trust a woman when the woman takes you into her confidence to tell you a story and you say, just kind of, suck it up and deal with it and get on. Enablers don't look like perpetrators. They don't look like outright patriarchs. They look like reasonable men who are just doing their job or reasonable women who say, we've all been through this, just deal with it, he's a jerk, just avoid him. Right? And that kind of advice that we give to each other of he's just a jerk, just avoid him, is in fact an enabling advice. I'm interested in enablement, I'm interested in complicity, I'm really interested in complicity. Um, complicity looks like keep the HR department, that's the human resources department in your workplaces, keep the HR department weak. Does anyone ever become a vice president in this company coming out of the HR department? I don't think so. Well, that's one of the reasons why a lot of women and men who face either racist or homophobic uh, behavior in a workplace never go to HR. But it serves patriarchal organizations to keep HR weak. So part of thinking about this, the connections between what seems trivial and everyday and what seems unusual and outrageous, part of charting the connections is to look not only at the perpetrators, the annoying perpetrators and the frightening perpetrators, but also look at the people who are complicit, the people who are dismissive, the people who are enabling, and the people who think if you are a serious woman in this profession, you simply get on with it. And that can be advice of women to women. And that is enabling as well. So I think for all of us now in kind of month five or six, let's be ready for the pushback, you have to make distinctions. Let's have language and examples of how this actually is a system and we're going after the system, not just the particular perpetrators. Let's actually talk about what patriarchy takes to be sustained. And it takes, it takes the mosquitoes as well as the assaulters. Thanks everybody. <laughs>